Futures are higher, 30 minutes until the start of the cash trade. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Coming up, an abrupt shakeup at Starbucks. The coffee chain surging after naming Chipotle CEO Brian Nickel as the new CEO and chairman. We also got U.S. producer prices in July. They rose by less than forecast, underscoring an ongoing moderation in inflationary pressures. And Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson warns of a challenging road ahead for stocks. He joins us later this hour to survey the investing landscape. Let's take a look right now, though, at where markets are trading 30 minutes ago until the bells ring. You can see there is green on the screen behind me, the S&P 500, currently up about six tenths of a percent before uh, the markets actually open. We were absolutely flat yesterday, so this is exciting. A bigger rally, if you take a look at big tech, the Nasdaq 100, up about 1%. Of course, we got softer than expected PPI that's working its way through the stock market and also through the bond market right now. Ten-year yields currently down about three basis points, Matt. I want to take a look at the ECAN chart on the Bloomberg terminal. This is a picture of PPI going over the last 12 months. You can see that it was being brought down by lower energy prices at the end of last year, beginning of this year. It has crept up over the last few months, but it is now coming down again. And the blue, uh, no, the blue um, square here is services. So it's really a shrinkage in services prices that's helped PPI to moderate a little bit today. And more on that Starbucks story here. Some pre-market -move movers on our side. Starbucks just surging up more than 14% pre-market on that CEO shakeup. Chipotle CEO taking over. They are buckling to activist pressure here, pushing for change at the coffee chain. Remember Brian Nickel coming from Chipotle over to Starbucks. Chipotle now down more than 7.6% pre-market, Katie. Yeah, it is pretty amazing, of course, to see the one-day pre-market moves on that news. But, Matt, I actually want to talk about the long-term performance of these two chains. You take a look at Chipotle. You had Brian Nickel take over on March 3rd. 2020. Since that time, uh, Chipotle shares are up 280%. You compare that to what Starbucks has done over that run, uh, down about 2%. So you think about sort of that black and white picture right here. It kind of makes sense that uh, Starbucks called up Brian Nickel. Yeah, Starbucks has been absolutely stagnant. That's why we get activist pressure. That's why Howard Schultz, who uh, used to run the chain and is now the biggest shareholder, um, is angry with, or let's say, dissatisfied uh, <laughs> with the operators. Maybe Brian Nickel comes in and changes that and gets the stock moving back in an upward Brian trajectory. Brian really did a good job at navigating a lot of those pressures that Starbucks is already feeling, that consumer pressure at a premium chain. Let's see if he could take it home with the coffee. You also think about him taking over March 3rd, 2020, just uh, really an incredible time. We have the perfect guest to unpack this news. Here with us for more is Nancy Tengler. She is Laffer Tengler Investments CEO. She owns both Starbucks and Chipotle stock. And that's such a great setup, Nancy. When you think about the news today, what's your reaction as a shareholder in both companies? Well, as I've told you before, Katie, investing is like being in a perpetual state of dissatisfaction. <laughs> so I, I cheered at the uh, at the Starbucks news um, and uh, on the Starbucks side uh, because the stock has been a colossal disappointment, as has Laxman. I'm sorry to say that. And so it was great to see the board take action, though they had to be prodded, of course, by activist investors. But Brian Nickel just worked magic at Chipotle. It's a member of our 12 Best Ideas portfolio. So now we're going to have to think a little bit about what we do there. Um, but he, he did all the right things and really drove the company through the use of Chipotle lanes, through the use of digitization, where they now get over a million dollars per store in digital orders. So he will fix Starbucks. I think that's the very good news. And uh, we'll have to see what happens at Chipotle. Okay, this is a man, Brian Nickel, that has had a lot of experience in the restaurant industry, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, Yum Brands, and then Chipotle. Starbucks is a different animal here. Yep. And there's a lot of, let's say, stakeholders here that he has to please. That is unions. That is activists investors. What do you want to see him do on day one? Well, I think the first thing he has to do is lay out his plan. And, um, you know, th there, there are just 
it, you can make minor changes and have profound in, have a profound impact on margins and growth. And so he and that is what he did at Chipotle. So while Shanali, I agree with you, you're absolutely right. He's got this is a little bit more complex. But really, when he took over at Chipotle, there were a lot of problems there too, and he he knew what to do. We we've, we've talked to some insiders at Starbucks that said Laxman just didn't he didn't understand retailing any restaurant re retailing, and he did not understand the Starbucks culture. I don't think Brian Nichols is going to make that mistake. Nancy, how much of the problem here is the consumer? I'm just thinking about the different products that these two companies offer, right? And um, most employers offer free coffee. You don't have to go and pay $5 for a cup of coffee at Starbucks. On the other hand, I can't get a burrito upstairs even here. So I do have to go to Chipotle. And let's be honest, they're delicious. So isn't there a difference <laughs> in the product that he's trying to sell? Yeah, you can get free everything at Bloomberg. That's why I like to come <laughs> in the studio. Um, yeah, I think, yes. So when we were making the decision as to which stock to put into the 12 best ideas portfolio, we, we, we basically said what you said, Matt, which is, I, I will pay $9 for a burrito. I'm not sure I'm going to pay $9 for a cup of a venti, um, shaken espresso. <clears throat> but but um, the, the whole idea of the brand and how you change consumer behavior. And that's what Starbucks did initially under Howard Schultz. And so I think what you'll see is Brian Nickel will, will develop a plan. I, I don't know what it is, but he'll develop a plan that will draw the consumer back in. And he'll also make it more convenient. I mean, the problem you have like in New York City, for example, is is what is the wait time and then, you know, the 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 mobile orders taking precedence over the in-store orders. He's going to have to flip that somehow to get people to spend more time and more money in the stores. Well, I spend uh, $5.72 on basically a small cold brew every single morning. I'm not sure I could handle much more, but it'll be interesting, of course, to see what Brian Nickel does over at Starbucks. But on the flip side of that, I mean, you started the interview by saying that being an investor, perpetual state of dissatisfaction. Are you thinking about trimming your Chipotle position here? I mean, you think about what Brian Nickel has done at the company. We were taking a look at the share price. It's just been a fantastic run over the past four and a half years or so. Yeah, well, Katie, we already trimmed it, um, and that that's sort of the good news, but we still own a, 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 a large position in the stock. I, I don't know yet. Um, I think we're going to have to dig in, see who the replacement is. I mean, really, the, the thesis around investing, of course, is, is earnings drives share prices, but managements drive earnings. And so you need to have quality management teams, which is why we jumped out of Intel three years ago. And that's what Starbucks felt. I was just talking to the team last night and they said, when are they going to get rid of this guy? Um, and they did it today. So at Starbucks, sorry. Um, so I do think it, it's going to matter who takes over the helm. And uh, so far, I don't know if that news is out yet, but I have not yet seen so it. So this is what we know now, Nancy. We know that the chief operating officer, Scott Boatwright, is going to be the interim CEO. We also know that Jack Hartung, who had announced his retirement from Chipotle in 2025, agreed to stay on indefinitely as the president of strategy. So there is a lot in flux here at Chipotle. Do you yeah. think they need to bring in an outsider just to get the caliber of leadership you got from Brian? Additionally, I think, um, you know, it'll it'll be somebody it needs to be somebody that can carry um, that gravitas that Brian Nickel had and, and has. Uh, and so, you know, good that the, the team is staying intact, um, but the, the CEO matters and it's going to be a headline issue that matters a great deal to investors. So, you know, we'll be talking today about whether or not the, the name is still a member of our 12 best ideas portfolio. Uh, that's how important Brian uh, is and was to, to the stock and to the company. But yeah, it's going to matter a great deal and, and uh, it's going to take some time. So the stock is likely to just trade sideways or down some. All right, Nancy, great to get you on uh, today. Thanks so much for joining us last minute. Obviously, this breaking news uh, is pretty exciting, If, especially if you're an owner of Starbucks shares and you are also an owner of Chipotle shares. And interesting to get your take on how they need to replace Brian. Let's turn now to the economy. U.S. producer prices rose less than expected in July, reflecting the first decline in services costs 
this year. Joining us now with more is Michael McKee, Bloomberg's chief international economics and policy correspondent. Mike, this is the first of a couple of inflation uh, data points that we're going to get this week. Yeah, and uh, I'm just going to segue from your last segment and tell Katie <laughs> I have bad news for you. No. In the PPI, roasted coffee went up 3.3 percent. That's a big increase. So uh, I'm going to have to switch to you're, you're, just... you're the victim here. Yeah. Overall, though, the numbers are really good, as Matt was saying. Uh, we saw flat uh, to uh, basically just barely up de uh, final demand and core. And that has pushed the year over year numbers down to 2.4% for core and 2.2% for the headline number. That's significantly lower than the 3% and 2.6% we saw the prior months. And they had been on an uptrend. And you can see this last uh, month they have broken that trend, which is going to be good news for the Fed. Now, what happened inside the numbers besides coffee? It was, as Matt told you at the top of the show goods prices they rose six tenths percent as gasoline prices pushed those up 2.8 percent but services prices fell by two tenths trade services which is basically wholesaler and retailer margins fell 1.3 percent they had risen 1.9 percent in june so uh, margins we may you may look for that in uh, earnings reports for retailers and wholesalers portfolio management prices went up by 2.3 percent it is you guys on wall street who are the inflation problem at the moment because of course you you get paid either way air fails down two tenths of a percent passenger car prices fell two tenths now let's take a look at ecan uh, this is our service on the bloomberg breaks everything down and uh people love this uh this basically shows you what happened with those trade services prices that's the blue numbers there final demand trade services had been going up pushing ppi higher now it falls that is a significant change in what we see in inflation and that if it continues could be good news for the fed all right, Mike McKee, appreciate the breakdown as always. We'll see you in 24 hours, of course, uh, less than 24 hours until we get that CPI print. Let's take a check on futures right now because we have a rally on our hands. You take a look at the S&P 500 up six tenths of a percent, even more so if you take a look at big tech with the NASDAQ 100 there. Of course, the idea is that you had that softer than expected PPI sort of sets the stage for CPI. Of course, investors hoping to get some good news tomorrow on the inflation front. Small caps joining in as well. The Russell 2000 currently up about eight tenths of a percent pre-market, Matt. All right, up next, we're going to talk to Kevin Holt. He's the CIO of U.S. Value Equities at Invesco. He says near-term volatility is creating long-term opportunities. This is Bloomberg. Not a high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. Moscow is hiking recruitment bonuses to avoid a repeat of the deeply unpopular policy of mobilizing citizens into its army, drafting them into its army. Ukraine continues to penetrate into <coughs> Russian territory. The military in Russia isn't getting enough new soldiers to keep pace with frontline losses, which are at their highest since the invasion of Ukraine began. Meanwhile, Elon Musk talked with former president Donald Trump last night or let him talk basically the Tesla CEO did take the opportunity to pitch himself for a role in a second Trump administration. I think it would be great to just have a government efficiency commission that takes a look at, uh, at, at these things and and just ensures that the taxpayer money the, the taxpayers hard earned money is spent in a good way. Um, and and, I, and I'd, I'd be happy to help out on such a commission. I'd if, love it. If it were formed. Well, you, you're the greatest cutter. Home Depot falling uh, pre-market after cutting its full year sales outlook. The company's CFO says consumers with money to spend have a deferral mindset, putting off purchases until interest rates decline. Katie? All right, let's keep the conversation going now with Kevin Holt. He is Invesco's CIO of U.S. Value Equities. And I do want to get to some existential questions about what mm -hmm. is value. But before we get there, if you just think about the performance that we've seen over the past couple weeks, uh, it feels like we've actually seen a bit of a revival in the value trade. You think about uh, some of those smaller companies getting love, some of those unloved sectors getting a second look, and then it fizzles. When are we going to see a sustainable pickup in value interest? 
Um, so I mean, I kind of think we're there. So what we're seeing right now is uh, so dislocation to markets and volatility, some earnings weakness. So I think as we move forward, um, some of these unloved stocks, particularly with an interest rate cut and cyclical areas of the economy, are going to start to uh, start to move. So when you think about the potential to broaden as well, there was a broadening for a while into small and mid caps. You've seen that pretty much erased, Kevin. Do you think you could take on more risk into places where perhaps the multiples have not caught up with where you've seen kind of the most love flowed to in the market? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So the small mid caps we think are very attractively valued. Um, there was some dislocation during the earnings season. I think volatility people sold small cap. Um, but we think this is a kind of a transitory phase we're on. So again, I think when you cut the interest rates, typically when you stimulate economic growth, those small and mid cap stocks will start to do better. And it's like anything, it, idiosyncratic stories. You have to you know, choose stories that are what we think are undervalued, unloved, where there could potentially be some changes or things that are misunderstood within that story. In terms of the carry trade, do you see that as you know, the unwinding of the carry trade as the reason for the almost correction that we saw, or was it a growth scare? I think it was, I think it was both those together. So I think you had some currency dislocation, which we've seen in the past, um, go back to 2015 with China. So as you, as you have these currency movements that surprise people, there are some unwinding trades. Um, so that caused part of the problem. Then you showed some weak economic data. And I think that kind of further exacerbated the sell-off. And let's face it, we were due for a correction. So um, I think it's healthy. I think it's normal. It happens usually once or twice a year where we get these 5% corrections. Um, so I, I, I think it's a good time to go now. Kevin, how do you avoid value traps in this market? I mean, you think about the traditional measurements, uh, what people have classically used, and it seems like that is probably going to lead you to some of those value traps that uh, people get worried about. How are you thinking about that? Well, I, I think your earlier conversation uh, regarding Starbucks is important. Management, capital allocation, those are the two most important things investing in any company, I think, whether it's growth or value. So I think it starts there. Um, and then... You know, secondarily, you have to think about these businesses, and particularly in today's age where technology, you know, services was 30% of the market. It's now 60% of the market. So it, it's grown so immensely over the last 30, 40 years. So I think you need to think about business and say, where are they going to be in five years? What role do they play? Um, you know, some of the consumer, consumer services names that we see, you know, that we own, you know, Meta and Google, um, they, you know, 19, 20 times earnings, not that expensive. Um, and they're taking share in digital advertising. As we look out over the future, that trend is going to continue. So I think as a value person, you, you, can't, you can't get, you know, what, what worked yesterday isn't necessarily what's going to work in the future, particularly in the AI and some of the technology areas. Mm. Well, to that point, what worked previously maybe doesn't work right now. How do you measure value? I mean, this is a conversation I've had with Sean O'Hara over at Pacer as well. They like to look at free cash flow yields, for example. What is your preferred metric for determining what's a good value right now? Yeah, so if you go back, we're, we're students of history. <laughs> so there are different metrics that work in different sectors when you go back 80 years. I do think at the end of the day, free cash flow uh, is the ultimate probably most important metric. But you can look at the free cash flow today, and if a firm is under earning, that means their cash flow will be depressed. So it's, it's coming upon us to say, okay, they're operating margins down. So the state of free cash flow today isn't really what the free cash flow will be in a normalized environment. Um, so, you know, in, in, in financial stocks, it's price of tangible book. Then we're looking at the return on tangible common equity um, to kind of get to a PE that we think is, is fair for those companies. And then, as you said, in consumer discretionary and in healthcare, free cash flow yield is it. And the return on invested capital. So if your return on invested capital is quite high, we want you reinvesting in your business, which may depress that free cash flow a bit. You think about cash flow and you think about CapEx. At the end of the day, how do you want to see companies using their funds on hand? Would you rather them be holding it for a rainy day at this point, given the concerns about the economy? Or would you be watching them rather plow it into some of these more moonshot projects like artificial intelligence? Yeah, so I think it depends on the company and what your core competency is. So, um, I, you know, I think banks at this point, um, you know, we want them to be conservative. You know, we don't know how bad the, the credit cycle will be. We think it's actually going to be manageable. And when you lower rates, some of the regional banks will start to outperform. Um, 
But I do think AI is real. So you have to, and it's kind of your judgment on what the return on invested capital is going to be of these projects. Uh, but if you just go into your, your Meta Messenger app now, you have the AI at the bottom of it. Um, and I think it's, it's going to change behavior. It's going to change how we do things. Um, so I think it's important to invest in those areas uh, that are going to make your business more efficient over time and you know lower a lot of your other costs. As a student of history, I wonder uh, what your take is on investing in an election year. I have heard that value stocks outperform usually the first six months after a vote, at least in the last 11 election elections. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I think it really is going to come down to do, you know, is there a sweep by one party? I don't think that's likely. Um, I think that, you know, but generally, I think we're going to, you know, as, as long as there's grid, gridlock, there's not too much either way. I personally would like to see some more fiscal conservatism, but that doesn't appear to be on the plate with either party at this point in time, because uh, I do think our, our national debt's getting uh, getting a little too high. Elon Musk wants a job in that area. <laughs> Maybe he'll keep spending too, who knows. Uh, Kevin, we thank you so much. That is Kevin Holt, CIO of U.S. Value Equities at Invesco. Now coming up, we are watching shares of Home Depot. They're struggling after the company reports a seventh straight quarterly drop in comparable sales. And now it's also lowering its outlook. Home Depot now down about 1.6%. We're gonna give you the details next. Stick with us, this is Bloomberg. Home Depot shares falling after second quarter sales disappointed and the company lowered its outlook for sales and profit. Let's discuss with Bloomberg consumer goods reporter Dasha Afanasieva. Dasha, thanks so much for joining us. Um, what's the problem at Home Depot? Is, just, is this just the weaker consumer that we see you know, across earnings season? It's the weaker consumer, but they're saying something slightly different here, which is that the consumer is so nervous that even the consumer that has the money to spend on a new bathroom, a new kitchen, etc., is actually deferring the spending, waiting for that crucial um, interest rate uh, cut. And that's what's led to this pretty chunky cut in outlook. Um, the upside, I guess, as you could see, is what they're hinting at, is that eventually there will be a boom, that eventually those, there'll be pent-up demand and people will eventually start renovating their homes. But up until then, it seems like they've taken the first, they've said they've taken the first half of the year and looking at how poorly that's gone um, mm -hmm. has led them to this big cut, which is much worse than what analysts expected. Dasha, we have to leave it there. That is Bloomberg's Dafa, Dasha Afanasieva, of course, on a highly watched story this morning. Now, coming up, we're going to talk to Morgan Stanley CIO Mike Wilson, joining us to share his outlook, as well as three stocks he's suggesting investors take a look at right now, all as the NASDAQ 100 futures extend their pre-market gain to more than 1%. It's a bullish day with some bearish feelings underneath. This is Bloomberg. Futures are rallying. We are moments away from the start of the cash trade. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Take a look at uh, what we see on futures right now. Just about seven tenths of one percent, two thirds of a percent on S&P futures. Nasdaq 100 futures. The Q's up one percent right now, and even the small caps are up about seven tenths of one percent. In terms of the bells this morning on the New York Stock Exchange, ADT ringing the opening bell with. Looks like a tugboat captain there. And then over here uh, on the NASDAQ, uh, we see uh, uh, BYMA, Bolsas y Mercados Argentinos. That's pretty exciting, uh, ringing the bell. In terms of the uh, rally, let's get over to Katie Greifeld right now. She can tell us what the indexes are doing the first few seconds of trading. Pretty exciting as well if you take a look at the screen behind me. I like you said, Matt, currently the S&P 500 up six tenths of a percent just seconds into the trading day. Even more so if you take a look at big tech up 1%, even small caps getting in on the action, the Russell 2000 up 7 tenths of a percent. Of course, we got better than expected, meaning softer than expected producer price index numbers this morning at 8.30, really raising hopes that we'll get good news when it comes to the consumer price index coming tomorrow. But before we get there, let's take a look at Starbucks, absolutely surging on news of a shakeup right now with Chipotle CEO 
taking over. The move, of course, comes as activist investors push for change at the coffee chain. That's what they got. Starbucks shares up 17.5% on the other side, Shanali. You have Chipotle down over 8% right now. What an absolutely massive week for the consumer sector, Katie. We're also going to keep an eye here on Home Depot. It cut its sales guidance on expectations that consumers will continue to hold back spending in the coming months, citing both high interest rates and inflation. Home Depot at the open now down about 1.5%, Matt. All right, I'm taking a look at the uh, big picture here. On the S&P 500 over the past three months, we saw in terms of closing prices, a drop from peak to trough of eight and a half percent. Now, we had Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley on the program July 8th. He said we'd see a 10% correction. And if you look at the intraday drop from, I think it was 5669 down to 51, uh, 17 or so, you see actually a 9.7% drop. So he was near as damn it to correct. We're pleased to say he's back here. Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, Chief U.S. Equity Strategist and Chief Investment Officer. Uh, there you have it. Basically, the 10% uh, correction that you called, we're wondering, is that it? Well, you, look, you never know, right? I mean, but it, 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 we thought it happened in the third quarter, so it just happened immediately. And there's always different reasons for why it happens. Look, our general take on the correction that we've seen is that we're probably going to be stuck in this range now. I mean, we had a pretty big shock. It wasn't just the correction we saw in the equity markets, but then we had the, the carry trade kind of unwind. And I don't know how people can sit back and feel comfortable with that. The, the main thing, though, is what you guys have been talking about this morning, right? The consumer is slowing, right? The, like all the consumer services companies in particular, it's not just the goods companies, and that has to be resolved here. So the way we think about it is, in order for markets to, to kind of make a, you know, a new high, I mean, you need multiples to expand, and that's gonna be very challenging in a world where growth is slowing, okay? Earnings expectations probably are still too high for the, for the second half of this year, and a Fed that's reluctant to be proactive, okay? And I, I don't disagree, people are criticizing the Fed, I'm like, well, look, they're just being data dependent. I mean, and, and so they're doing their job. They're, they're gonna react if they need to. If they overreact, then that probably exacerbates the carry trade problem. So they're not gonna overreact. Whether you think you're gonna get that 25 or 50 basis point cut over in September, it's still more than a month away. Right. So as rates remain elevated, how much more pain does the consumer see? Do you think investors are perhaps underappreciating how much more pain there's well, left in the plus consumer? Plus they're lags, right? It's not like the Fed cuts at September 18th and the consumer goes to Home Depot oh, and buys data. a new washing machine on September 19th, right? Yeah. Well, that's generally been our view, right? I mean, we've yeah. been underweight consumer discretionary and sort of overweight the later cycle groups and then defensives on that premise, meaning you know, we, we think being defensive right here makes a lot of sense for, for all the reasons you mentioned. It, all these things work with a, with a big lag, and I, I completely agree. In fact, our note this week, we discussed this in detail, particularly housing, mm. right? We, like 25, 50 basis points isn't gonna do anything, mainly because most people's mortgage rates are sub four, if not sub 3%. So you need two to 300 basis points of cuts to really get some of these interest rate sensitive areas moving. And that, that's just gonna continue to weigh on consumer sentiment, it's gonna weigh on consumer stocks. And so that's, you know, that's how we're set up. We're set up to be sort of underweight that space. And Mike, I wanna get your thoughts on some of the technicals here, specifically when it comes to positioning in the big tech sector, because there's a note out from uh, Citi Group this morning saying that there's still $22.5 billion worth of long positioning on the NASDAQ 100. And in their view, that makes the index still pretty vulnerable here to any sort of sentiment shock, maybe at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. What are your thoughts on positioning right now after the few weeks that we've seen? Yeah, I mean, the faster money crowd has adjusted significantly, even the systematic strategies and some of the long short community. But the, the asset owners, right, retail, long onlys, that, that crowd is still very exposed. And so there is length in the marketplace. It's not just NASDAQ 100, it's kind of equities writ large. Mm. So the way we think about it right now is the valuation is just inappropriate, right? Valuation doesn't matter until it matters, and then it, that's all that matters. And we've been very adamant that 19 times is kind of a fair market multiple in a soft landing, okay? So today we're north of 20 times still. So I just, I don't, it's very hard for me to get excited about the index, which is why we're really focused at the stock level and the sector level to try and make money. A little more on the carry trade here, because yeah. the carry trade is not really isolated to the yen. I think that's an important dynamic of this. The other important dynamic, I think, is how much investors didn't realize how much leverage was under the system. If you think about kind of what is left to unwind, these kind of exogenous shocks, do you still worry that there could be another one this year? Well, there's still a lot of leverage in the system. I mean, so that, that I just sort of spoke about equity length is high, okay? Bond length is low, 
So, I mean, people are skewed to having more risk on. Then you take into account the leverage in the system through products like triple levered ETFs or you know, daily expiration options, um, just the leverage in the system as people are doing carry trades of all sorts. Yeah, there's still a lot, there's more leverage in the system than there should be given the uncertainty still of the eventual outcome of the economic you know, events that are, that are still in front of us. Speaking of those, you said you expect earnings to be weaker in the second half. We've had an excellent earnings season in the second quarter. Right. Um, I think 11% is what we've seen in terms of profit growth year over year. Why is the second half gonna be harder? Do you think tough comps from last year? Um, do you think we're not gonna see a continued broadening out of earnings growth? So what part of its expectations? So the, there's a big hockey stick in the fourth quarter and there's been a lot of discussion around a pickup in orders in the second half of the year that continues to be elusive. So as we come into September, this is, and we wrote about this this week too, the key data for us is going to be what are companies saying in September about order books? If we don't see order books pick up in September, your year is kind of shot in terms of seeing a reacceleration that's now in the numbers. So we're open minded. It could change, but I don't think it's going to be because the Fed's cutting rates. It's going to be perhaps maybe people hunkered down a bit and now we can see a reacceleration. But the, the comparisons are difficult, as you mentioned, particularly in the fourth quarter for the for the mag seven. And that's part of the story, too. And so, look, the, the, the key thing that we look at is forward next 12 month earnings growth. That is now peaking. And when that peaks, that means multiples come down. And that's as simple as I can make it. So 20 times to 19 times, that's our baseline. That would be kind of at the low end of that range we wrote about this weekend. And that would be a place where I would get interested at the index. That's still four, five, six percent away. And then if it gets worse than that and gets cheap, then we'd get really interested. But that's like 17, 18 times. And so tying this into some of the economic data that we've gotten in the past 24 hours, of course, we had the NFIB optimism index come out. That was good news. An interesting detail within it, though, if you take a look at the report, it showed that the share of firms planning price increases dropped to a net 24 percent. That's probably good news for the inflation picture. But I read that as basically these firms are out of pricing power. Yeah. It's a really good point, and, and I think this is, this is, be careful what you wish for on inflation. We've been talking about this for a while. You know, the market did sort of make its top. Okay, part of that was on a good lower CPI number, and we wrote about that in early July. You know, weaker inflation data now is potentially bad news for stocks. It's good news for bonds, okay? Bad news for stocks, why? Because that's pricing power, to your point. And the PPI in particular is more aligned to revenue growth than even the CPI. So I'll, I'll be interested tomorrow to see if we get the same data point. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not excited for stocks because inflation is surprising on the downside. I'm excited that maybe my trade in bonds looks better, and that's why we like defensive stocks. And I think that all kind of sinks nicely. Well, Mike Wilson, sit tight. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley sticking with us. Let's take a quick check on this market right now. Of course, nine minutes after the bells rang, you can see this rally building on the momentum that we saw in the pre-market. The S&P 500 up about eight tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100, big tech, extending the rally up 1.2 percent. Small caps, too, getting in on the action, of course, after that softer than expected PPI reading. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's get a quick check on what's going on in stocks right now. We have, in terms of the indexes, rallies. You can see the S&P 500 up eight tenths of 1% at 53.87. The NASDAQ 100 gaining more than 1%. And even the small caps, the Russell 2000, up eight tenths of 1%. So across the board gains on, uh, I guess, optimism that the Fed has more room to cut now that PPI producer prices didn't rise quite as quickly as we had been anticipating. Katie? Yeah, and we'll see, of course, if CPI can keep the party going tomorrow. But for now, it's time for Top Calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, City says Hormel is a buy. The analyst sees upside earnings potential for the deli meat maker thanks to improving sales trends and lower feed costs. Next up, Bernstein says that Warner Brothers Discovery no longer a buy, cutting its recommendation to market perform. The media company, of course, is still reeling from last week's quarterly earnings report in which it reported a $9 billion write down stemming from the losses at its TV networks. And finally, Wedbush initiating coverage of Arteva Biotherapeutics, 
with a buy. The biotech company focuses on autoimmune diseases and cancers, also initiated at a buy over at TD Cowan, Needham, and Jeffries. Shanali. And Katie, we're back here with Mike Wilson, Chief U.S. Equity Strategist and Chief Investment Officer at Morgan Stanley. And Morgan Stanley adding three stocks to their fresh money buy list. Can you explain kind of what the thinking was behind adding these three? It was Abvi, Northrop Grumman, and Public Service Enterprise Group. You guys are hunting for value, it feels like. Well, we're hunting for defensiveness, right? So obviously one's a defense company, one's a utility, and one's a, a pharmaceutical company, and they're all uh, in a pretty good uptrend right now. They, you know, the technicals look pretty good. And we think this is what you should be gravitating towards. You know, we've had a, some of a defensive posture really since May when we felt growth was peaking. That has worked. Uh, we're just sort of doubling down on that same, same view. And as you know, we tend to go sort of against the grain. We don't necessarily go with the momentum. This would be definitely an out of consensus sort of view at the moment. It's starting. We think there's more to go in the defensive rotation. Do we not, if we see Fed cuts, um, you know, I, I, I always think about how long it's going to take for them to work their way into the economy, but the market is instantly going to start to buy maybe mid caps, small caps, maybe the Russell 2000? No. I mean, I, we've been very consistent. I mean, it could, yes, of course, but our view is that's not what you should be doing. We saw, once again, uh, people tried to do that trade in, uh, in July. Um, it didn't work out so well. Now, we think that was more about a degrossing, okay? So as people rotated out of the winners, they were probably covering some of their shorts in these areas that they were underweight, and that really is what drove that. And now we have a, a very kind of negative technical pattern where it looks like that was a, a one-hit wonder. And historically, when the Fed cuts interest rates, small cap, mid caps do not outperform. Hmm. Now, the market can go up, but typically small mid caps still underperform. Even if it's a mid-cycle slowdown, that's, that's what the data shows. So I just think people either don't understand that history, they're just eager to do something different. That's not the trade. We think the trade is to stay up the quality curve and skew more defensive than growth oriented because rates coming down will be most beneficial for that cohort. And the point has been made that you take a look at some of the small cap indexes, such as the Russell 2000. It's a bit junkier than it has been in the past. I have to imagine some of that is that you aren't seeing those smaller companies IPO, those high quality small companies actually tap the public markets. It's a very good point. I mean, the, the thing that's really been missing is we haven't seen a lot of equity issuance. And we know there's supply out there. There are companies that probably you know, want to go public. Um, there's probably companies that want to raise equity capital because their balance sheets are a little sloppy. And it just hasn't happened. And I think the reason why is there's just not a, there's not a strong bid for that. I mean, we've seen that all year. Once again, the Russell 2000 is basically flat on the year. The equal weighted Russell's down on the year. The equal weighted S&P is still underperforming the overall S&P. So the, the breadth of the market continues to be soft, and that just continues to speak to this idea that we're late cycle, it's not mid cycle. Fed cutting is usually makes the market narrower, not broader. Well, just to follow up quickly on that point, uh, like you said, there hasn't been that consistent bid. Does the logic then follow if we did see a consistent bid for some of those smaller companies that IPO actually would pick up here? It could, absolutely. I mean, we're open-minded as always to anything. If we were to see in September, for example, a, a very broad rally like in July that looked a little healthier, meaning in an up market, not a down market, not a degrossing, then we would have to revisit our, our view on that. Something else would be going on that would suggest that, hey, maybe the Fed is not only going to cut rates, but it's going to have a meaningful impact and it's going to help these companies. The other thing you brought up a good point is the Russell 2000 is really a lower quality version of small cap. So I want to make it clear, like we don't hate all small cap companies. I mean, that's, that's silly. The S&P 600 is a higher quality version of that. And so as you hunt for small mid cap stocks, and I, I would advise doing that, just once again, stay up the quality curve. Don't, you don't have to go down to the junk pile. I really feel the need to go back to something we were talking about before. You sat down, we said, okay, Mike Wilson could take his victory lap. We saw that 10% 10 correction, 10 correction, nearly 10% that you were thinking of. You saw it earlier than we expected. What does this mean? Does this correction have further to go? Well, it's still the third quarter, okay? And once again, the seasonals right now are just not particularly great. So I, I, as I said at the beginning, I think we're gonna stay in this range. I, I find it hard to believe we're gonna break out back towards the highs. I also don't think we're gonna completely break down uh, in a way that would argue that we're entering a, a new you know, bear market, okay? But the lower end of the range is, to me, the magnet now, because that's where the valuation support really lies. 19 times is closer to the low end of that range. You said you're focused on jobless claims. I talked to Ed Hyman on Sunday from ISI. He said the same thing. If we get a labor market that really weakens, um, you know, and the SOM rule's already been triggered, but if we get, for example, I think September 6th, we get non-farm payrolls, and if we get another jump up in unemployment to four and a half, four point six 
Um, do you think we see more mayhem in the markets? Uh, yes, I mean, a 4.6 would be pretty definitive. Now, just to be clear, our economics house call is still we're in a soft landing outcome. What I would suggest, though, is that the market is priced for that, right? The market is priced for a soft, actually even better than a soft landing outcome. It's priced for a reacceleration. So just kind of putting a little risk back into the market that maybe the hard landing is no longer zero, but it's 20 or 30% again, that once again just argues that multiples will probably bleed lower into September, even if the jobs data is kind of stable. Because at the end of the day, the jobs market is weakening. And so how could you sit here and say that the risk of a recession is zero, which is kind of what's priced in the equity market? And one last thing, the bond market is definitely pricing a higher risk of a hard landing. I mean, that's what the, that's what the yield curve is telling you. That's what the two-year yield versus the Fed funds is telling Does you. Does that divergence worry you as an equity? Well, I'm just saying as an equity person, you should pay attention. Sure. I mean, the bond market has a, probably a better you know, look at, okay, what is the risk here? The, the, bond, the bond market is not saying recession, to be clear. It's saying the risk of a recession has gone up in the last two months, which makes sense, given what you just said. All right, Mike Wilson, we have to leave it there. Great point to leave on, though, that you can't look at any asset class in a vacuum. Mike Wilson, come back soon. That, of course, is Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. Now, we need to go back to what's going on with Starbucks because it is a monumental move that we're looking at. Starbucks up 21% Chanel, biggest move ever. Chipotle also is steepening its losses, down more than 12%. Elliott is out now with a statement. Of course, this is the big activist hedge fund firm that took a stake in Starbucks. They say that they have been engaged with the board for the past two months regarding their perspective, and they view today's announcement as a transformational step forward for the company. They welcome Brian Nickel. They look forward to continuing their engagement with the board, so it's not over yet. And they I, work toward the realization of the full potential, according to a statement. I think everybody has to be careful. I mean, this is like key man risk, right? Yeah. Just because one guy moves from a chain that makes delicious burritos that you can't get at the <laughs> office. Yeah. To a chain that makes okay. expensive coffees that are free upstairs. Starbucks shares up on a day by $18 billion in market cap. He's an $18 billion man, Katie. There you go. Of course, we'll <laughs> see if uh, that momentum actually continues, of course. But speaking of activism, up next, we're going to tell you about an activist fund that's had an impressive run up so far this year. That's next in our Wall Street beat. This is Bloomberg. It's time now for the Wall Street Beat, and today we're looking at the success of an activist fund run by Boaz Weinstein. The Saba Capital CEF Special Opportunities Fund jumped over 20% this year so far. It invests exclusively in a handful of closed-end fund products from BlackRock. Bloomberg hedge fund correspondent Kathy Burton now here with us uh, to talk about exactly how he's made so much money, because the reality is when he's attacked a lot of these funds, he didn't really win those board seats. No, he didn't, but he has, the BlackRock has agreed to buy back shares in a lot of the funds, and that's helped the price rise. So he has had a victory in there. But you also think about the closed-end fund universe. Of course, a lot of these closed-end funds have been trading at pretty big discounts, historically significant discounts to their net asset value. It feels like also just the market is in his favor right now because we have started to see those discounts narrow at large. Yes, that's true. And so it's hard to say that it's whether what part is luck and what part is him pushing the companies to do something. But uh, it has worked this year for him. So, I mean, I can only think about Bill Ackman when I think of <laughs> giant closed-end funds, although his, um, in, 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 the, in this case with PSUS, didn't come to fruition. Do we know any more about that? Are they just rethinking it and going to launch a different kind of product? Uh, that's what we've been told, but we have no details about what that is. There's been a lot of chatter about what it could be, but uh, we're really just waiting to see at this time. Uh, one more on Boaz here, because realistically, when things get hard is when he used to make a lot of money. Volatility, which we saw last week. So has he changed his identity here? Is he more of a closed-end fund activist now than he is a tail fund manager? Well, it really depends on the market, I think. Um, when things are... Are, when there's not a lot of volatility, then he's made a lot of money historically on these closed-end fund uh, products and bets. 
And when there's a lot of volatility, like there was in 2020, for example, he made a ton of money in his more traditional way. So I think last week he did well, but I think uh, before that there hasn't been that much volatility this year. All right, Catherine, thanks very much. Catherine Burton there uh, reporting on, in this case, Boaz, but I recommend you go to the Bloomberg and check her byline for deep reporting in the Wall Street beat. Let's get to the trading diary. This is what you need to be watching this week. We got PPI today. Tomorrow we get CPI, so more inflation. On Thursday we get retail sales, which Shanali's watching very closely, plus earnings from retail giant Walmart, as well as farm equipment maker Deere. On Friday, U.S. housing start to release, plus UMICH. Consumer sentiment data. This is Bloomberg. All right, we are 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Coming up, U.S. producer prices rose in July by less than forecast. And it underscores an ongoing moderation in inflationary pressures. And an abrupt shakeup at Starbucks. The coffee chain surges after naming Chipotle CEO Brian Nickel as the new CEO and chairman. And in today's C-Suite, we'll take a closer look at the health of the consumer with the CEO of Tantra Shopping Centers and Shark Tank's Barbara Corcoran. But first, before we get there, let's take a look at this market. Of course, 30 minutes after the bells rang, you can see that rally is well underway. The S&P 500 currently up about nine-tenths of a percent. A big, big rally on our hands when it comes to the big tech companies. The NASDAQ 100 up about 1.4 percent after that softer-than-expected PPI read this morning. And you can see that in the bond market as well. Ten-year Treasury yields currently down about four basis points, Janali. And in the last hour, we sat down with Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, and here's what he had to say about the U.S. consumer. Consumer is slowing, right? The, like, all the consumer services companies in particular, it's not just the goods companies, and that has to be resolved here. So the way we think about it is, in order for markets to, to kind of make a, you know, a new high, I mean, you need multiples to expand, and that's going to be very challenging in a world where growth is slowing, okay, earnings expectations probably are still too high for the, for the second half of this year, and a Fed that's reluctant to be proactive. Joining us now, Kestra Chief Investment Officer Kara Murphy. She helps oversee $122 billion in assets under management. And you think about the worries about the consumer under the surface and what we're seeing this week. Yes, there are some one-off stories with Starbucks and Chipotle, but you saw what happened at Home Depot, and you realize that perhaps there might still be more pain to come. How do you feel about it? So we've been seeing for a while this kind of uh, more cautious consumer coming. So if you even go back a couple of years and look at these huge COVID era payments, those started to subside. We started to see savings subside within consumers and we've started to see more caution. So if you look at consumer confidence numbers, those have been at lows, which is quite surprising given the broader economy. Now what's buoyed the consumer has been a very, very strong labor market. And of course, in the last few weeks, we've seen a little bit softer data on the labor side as well. So I think this has been a long time coming and it's not necessarily unhealthy. The U.S. economy has been really, really strong and has been held aloft by a lot of this consumer spending. And so now we're seeing a little bit more caution enter the market, which kind of makes sense. Doesn't it seem like that's going to continue? I mean, um, we've seen consumer weakness from trip bookings, TripAdvisor, uh, Airbnb showed some consumer weakness. Disney parks showed not the kind of consumer uh, spending growth that we were expecting. And it strikes me that um, th it's going to be difficult to turn Starbucks around in the face of this, right? No matter who the star CEO is that you bring in. Yeah, I think I would expect this to continue to soften, right? It, the Fed needs to see the labor market soften more from here. If that happens, that will additionally slow consumer spending. What we've also seen, if you look in, for instance, credit card data, that has really helped some consumers kind of keep their spending aloft. We're starting to see higher delinquencies. So it's very much this kind of careful balancing act between allowing the consumer to slow a bit, 
But then also with interest rate cuts on the horizon, that can help ease some of those burdens on the credit side. Now, I think with Starbucks, it's super interesting. It's not often that we get to see in such stark reality the importance of management. And so, you know, you look at Starbucks versus Chipotle, same sort of macro consumer trends that are affecting both of those companies, but very, very different experiences today. Now, your question is, can the new management come in and sort of move beyond those macro forces? The market is telling us that they think the new management management can in fact do this. Well, I want to talk a little bit more directly about that because you take a look at Starbucks. It's up 22 percent, almost 23 percent. That, of course, is the biggest rally, one day rally ever for that stock. And I see your point that management is important here. But does this start to feel a little bit over egged? I mean, are we introducing key man risk into this stock? I think it is a little dangerous when you put too many hopes on a single management team. One other thing that I want to highlight, though, is part of this management reshuffle at Starbucks is also reemphasizing non-U.S. And so that's a really important part of this whole consumer story, where it's not just reliant on the U.S. consumer, but the broader international consumer as well. So for sure, they have you know a tough job ahead of them. Have you uh, restructured your portfolio to account for this kind of consumer weakness? Do you think the broader market has done it already? I think we're likely in for some more volatility in the near term. Now, it's not just you know U.S. consumer that's a concern. We also have political risk here in the U.S. We have ge geopolitical risk outside. You have valuations at highs. So it makes sense that the market has a little bit of grinding to do over the next few weeks or months. But that said, we've been sort of keeping our positions where they are. Um, and that is we're expecting second half of the year for the market to continue to broaden out a little bit outside of these MAG7 names and start to see some other areas of the market do better. So how are you playing that broadening curve? Do you buy something like the S&P 600? That was kind of a recommendation we show over from Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. Perhaps the Russell 2000 is too fragile, but there are other ways to get at those small and mid caps. Or do you buy specific names? I think the S&P 6 is a great example of where you're going a little bit down in market cap, but not all the way to the super small names that might be a little bit more at risk in a softening economic environment. But even just outside of some of the largest names within the S&P 500, you still have opportunities on the lower end of that 500 scale. So as soon as you kind of get outside of that very small area of the market that's done very well, you start to see a lot more opportunities, a lot more valuation support, more earnings uh, likely to come in the second half of the year. Um, so there's a lot to pick from. Well, that's what I want to talk about because we launched this show on July 8th. Suddenly, small caps were ripping. Some of those unloved sectors were absolutely ripping. And a lot of people told us that you're going to see earnings broaden out and support that momentum in the market. It feels like so far you take a look at the earnings picture. It's been kind of mediocre. We haven't necessarily seen that broadening out. So what makes you confident that we will see it in the second half? Yeah, it's it's been interesting because it you know there was a moment where small caps outperformed and then it did a quick round trip. But we were talking even then as we were sort of um, optimistic about continued small cap outperformance that it was not going to be a straight line. It never is. But when you look at forward expectations for earnings within the smaller cap side, those are expected to start to really ramp up in the second half of the year and into next year. And what happens is that when you have this massive valuation differential between small names and large names, the market is a little bit better able to wait for those uh, earnings to really come. So again, this won't happen tomorrow, but we think over the next like two, four, six quarters that we'll start to see some more earnings support for those names. Kara, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Kara Murphy is Chief Investment Officer of Kestra Investment Management. More now on that Starbucks news. Last hour, we spoke with Nancy Tangler of Laffer Tangler Investments. She owns both Starbucks and Chipotle. Nickel just worked magic at Chipotle. It's a member of our 12 Best Ideas portfolio. So now we're going to have to think a little bit about what we do there. Um, but he, he did all the right things and really drove the company through the use of Chipotle lanes, through the use of digitization, where they now get over a million dollars per store in digital orders. So he will fix Starbucks. I think that's the very good news. And uh, we'll have to see what happens at Chipotle. Joining us now is Andrea Felstead, Bloomberg Opinion columnist covering consumer goods and the retail industry. And Andrea, it's amazing to watch, uh, you know, these share price moves, the biggest gain Starbucks has ever seen, instantly adding 20 percent to uh, their market cap. But can one man, you know, as good as he was at Chipotle, really bring back Starbucks, which has been, uh, I guess, 
simmering on low? Well, the thing about Starbucks, it's not a big breakup or a big shake-up. It's about doing lots of little things better. And it sounds like from what he did at Chipotle, that's exactly what he's doing. So in theory, he should be able to do that at Starbucks. So you think about these moves that you're seeing here, and what is the biggest challenge? On one hand, there's a worry about the crunch on the consumer, but you did see Chipotle still navigate that. That's right. I think the biggest challenge is you're coming into a company. You've got an activist investor, Elliot. They have welcomed his appointment. You've also got Howard Schultz, still a big shareholder, chairman emeritus, still you know cares deeply about the company. He's got to manage those factors. So he's got to push through all the changes that the company needs while managing those rather tricky factors. Yeah, of course, uh, a lot of cross currents there. So, I mean, you add it all together. Do you think that Brian Nickel, the thinking here is that the board wants him to come in and make a big change? I mean, is that what they're looking for by looking outside? Yes and no. I think I think they clearly want want the operations to improve. There's going to be a big test on what they do, say, with China. Um, you know, do, do they do they sell or sell all a part of China? Howard Schultz has been a big, you know, fan of the China business. Other investors want it spun off. So that I think that'll be a key test of just how much freedom and how much leeway um, the company gives the new CEO to really make those far reaching changes. One thing here that Elliot's statement said today was not only do they welcome this as a transformational step, but also that they look forward to working with the company and continuing our engagement. When you still have an activist in your stock like this, what does it mean about maybe the way that Brian Nickel would run the company uh, if he wasn't just doing it without Elliot? On his back. It can actually be rather helpful. So if you're a new CEO coming in and you've got an activist, actually having the activist there can give you a bit more license for change. We saw this with Nestle. Nestle had a new CEO, they had an activist, and actually that allowed the CEO to push through some things that, you know, were, were quite new to the company. He, he did big, he actually did big disposals and acquisitions. Starbucks doesn't need that, but it does need change and, and having that activist investor can be helpful. And Andrea, I'm curious to get your thoughts on where this leaves Chipotle. Of course, we've been talking about this whole show, how since he took over in March 2020, we've seen Chipotle shares absolutely fly higher, up about 280% before the start of trading today. I mean, it feels like they're losing a pretty big asset here. Exactly. They will have to, you know, really just carry on. It, it does seem as if they are back on track. Um, so that you know the new management will, will, will have to sort of carry on but sometimes when you take over from a very successful CEO that can bring its own pressures uh, you know new management must uh, must continue their sort of legacy and you know and, and then sometimes move in a different direction it, it can also be quite tricky we've seen you know new CEOs after long tenured predecessors sometimes not have the easiest time we should point out Chipotle shares uh, the drawdown from the peak in June is 30 percent. So they've lost almost a third of their value since they hit that high. Andrea, here in the U.S., we have been contending with consumer weakness throughout really a strong earnings season. You cover this uh, industry globally. Is it specific to the U.S. or do you see it in the U.K. and Europe as well? Um, I think the UK is slightly different. The UK is actually sort of, I think, on the road to recovery. Inflation's coming down, interest rates are coming down, wage growth is still healthy. The consumer should be in a good place. What we're seeing is a real disconnect between what should be a feel good factor and what people are spending. Andrea, we thank you so very much. That is Andrea Felstead of Bloomberg Opinion. Now, just taking a quick look here, it's fascinating. When you see this a drop in Chipotle's stock as well, uh, you do have Bill Ackman in Pershing Square being one of the biggest losers here. Remember, at the end of last year, Chipotle was one of the top three holdings in his fund. You see it in the performance of his closed-end fund. Mm -hmm. Chipotle today losing almost $10 billion in market cap. 
So certainly a painful day, but I mean, it's important to note that he's a painful held couple of months because it's true. down 30% but since June. When it comes to Chipotle, I mean, he's held this stock for years. We've been talking about the good performance uh, over the past four and a half years or so. It's interesting, too, if you bring in Starbucks, he uh, cut his Starbucks stake in February of 2020. So. Of course, he's been involved in both of these names that we're talking about. Fascinating. So he made some of the pain from Starbucks, but certainly now missing out on those losses over at Chipotle. We're going to switch gears next. We're going to talk about the world's richest man angling for a new gig. We're going to, of course, talk about Elon Musk and that big conversation he had with the former president last night. Details of that up next. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning. And first up, the medical device maker Baxter International announcing today it will sell its kidney care unit to Carlisle for $3.8 billion. Now, the transaction expected to close later this year or early next year. Carlisle, of course, has been a private equity investor in the medical tech sector for over 10 years. Next up, General Motors has been laying off staff in China as it overhauls its operations in the region. Now, these cuts represent a major strategy shift for the company, which earned billions of dollars in China as recently as 2018. GM, of course, though, is facing overcapacity in the region thanks to a flood of local competitors. And the Roger Federer backed on holdings, reporting a mixed bag of earnings. The sneaker maker saw sales jump 28%, but the gross profit margin came in behind estimates. On, of course, trying to find a foothold in its challenge against established players such as Adidas and Nike. And finally, Home Depot raising a warning flag on the U.S. economy. The DIY retailer says that consumers are spending less to remodel their homes thanks to high interest rates and concerns that the broader economy is souring. And of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Elon Musk interviewed former President Donald Trump last night, and this Tesla CEO took the opportunity to pitch himself for a second role in the Trump administration. Take a listen. I think it would be great to just have a government efficiency commission that takes a look at, uh, at, at these things and, and just ensures that the taxpayer money, the, the taxpayer's hard-earned money is spent in a good way. Um, and and, I, and I'd, I'd be happy to help out on such a commission I'd if, love it. if it were formed. Well, you, you're the greatest cutter. He's a great cutter, Elon Musk. Trump <laughs> said earlier he was so proud of him for firing all those people at Twitter. For more on that conversation, let's bring in Bloomberg Businessweek columnist and co-host of the Elon Inc. podcast, Max Chafkin. Max, um, I was pretty astounded, actually, at um, the amount of pandering that Elon Musk did uh, for this former president. And to be fair, you know, when you're talking to a former president, I'm sure you're um, uh, going to be respectful, but it really seemed like he was trying to get something. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was crazy to me as well, listening to it, especially as someone who's followed Elon Musk for a long time. He tends to disagree with people when they say things, when they minimize climate change or, or say some of the things that Trump said. And he was, um, you know, very eager during this conversation, as he said, to cater to Donald Trump. Of course, um, Elon Musk is a savvy operator, and, and you know, I think he's, he's doing his best to, uh, to flatter a, a potential leader of the free world. And, at this, and the other thing that's happened is Musk has sort of put him Himself in this position where he almost needs Trump support mm. and is, and I think, very much rooting for a Trump uh, victory in November. Can you talk about the evolution of this relationship? Because Musk was involved in the first administration, then he quit it in a huff, uh, and then they traded insults back and forth for a few years, and now they're friends again. Yeah, as Musk said during this conversation, as he likes to say, he's sort of been all over the place politically. You know, before he was sort of close to Trump during the uh, first Trump presidency, you know, he was close to Obama. He, he framed himself, you know, very much as this kind of left of center environmentalist during the Obama years. During the Trump years, as you said, he sought to find, you know, areas of common ground. He served on a uh, commission, another commission, um, which he then resigned from in 2016. Um, what's happened over the last few years is after buying Twitter, Musk has
has really tacked to the right in terms of his sort of social media persona, and at the same time has kind of done almost like a bear hug around um, the, the Trump camp and around the Trump kind of political and cultural movement. And I mean, that's what we saw during this interview. Musk was at pains to say it's not an interview, it's, it's a conversation, almost, you know, almost like heading off even the, the faintest suggestion that this might be adversarial. You know, there are business reasons as well that this kind of conversation would be happening. One, of course, is Tesla, but the other, of course, is actually X. Twitter. In recent days, Trump has started tweeting again. You've seen Trump Media and Technology Group down some 10 percent over the course of three days. How important is Donald Trump and his presence on this social media platform? I mean, Donald Trump is probably the second most important influencer on Twitter X after Elon Musk. I mean, he is... I, Elon Musk has you know, model himself after Trump in terms of his persona. He obviously has a lot of admiration, as Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of Twitter, did for, for Trump's sort of persona and has wanted him to come back. So this is like a huge win for Elon Musk, for X. And there are lots of other ways that Trump could help Elon Musk if he's elected president. You know, SpaceX is a major government contractor. Tesla still, despite the huge sales, depends on government subsidies to some extent. Um, you know, Musk has all these research ventures that will need regulatory approval. So there are lots of ways that this trade, if you think of it as many, a trade, could help him. Many subsidized. In fact, I think we all recall when Donald Trump wrote of Elon Musk, uh, when he came to the White House asking me for help on all of his many subsidized projects, whether it's electric cars that don't drive long enough, driverless cars that crash, or rockets to nowhere, without which subsidies he'd be worthless, and telling me how big of a Trump fan and a Republican he was, I could have said, drop to your knees and beg, and he would have done it. <laughs> Did we see him doing it last night? It, well, no, but he was, as you said earlier, you know, very much catering, seeking to flatter Trump, talking about, you he know, how... He was playing how, the beta to how, Trump's alpha. Let's be honest, And not, right? you know, not, only, not only playing the beta to Trump's alpha, but repeatedly suggesting that Trump, you know, on during the stream that we needed a tough president, you know, Trump was that guy. Um, and again, very staggering uh, just to watch as somebody who's seen Musk like to take up that space. Typically, on the other hand, you know, this is kind of what power does. And if there was any doubt, like who who the more powerful person in that room or in that Twitter space was, you know, I mean, we it was settled at the end of the night. Well, it's been a volatile relationship between two huge personalities, so it's going to be fascinating to see how uh, this continues to evolve. That, of course, is Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chapkin, and you can listen and subscribe to Max's podcast, Elon Inc., on the Bloomberg Terminal or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, still ahead, we're going to take a look at some of the stories attracting high interest this morning, including the U.S. lifting restrictions on the sale of bombs to Saudi Arabia. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Now to high interest, look at what's making headlines around the world. Ukraine's top military commander said the military has seized about 1,000 kilometers of the border region since the incursion into Russia began. An official told Bloomberg that the attack on Russia was intent on shocking President Putin and had been considered for some time before the surprising assault in the last week. The Wall Street Journal reports that the Biden administration will send Saudi Arabia shipments of bombs worth more than $750 million in the coming month. months. The move comes as Washington lifts restriction on sales of bombs to Riyadh after placing such sales on hold since 2021. And the developer behind the World Trade Center complex in Manhattan is eyeing more opportunities uptown. Larry Silverstein said he would consider expanding more in Midtown as commercial property distress spurs more deal making in the sector. The 93 year old real estate mogul is still looking for a tenant for two World Trade Center. Let's get a quick check on what's going on in the markets here. Just almost an hour into the trade, we're up three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. The NASDAQ 100 up one and a third percent. When we come back, we're going to talk with Barbara Corcoran, founder of the Corcoran Group. This is Bloomberg.
Small business owners are both optimistic and uncertain. The NFIB optimism index rising for a fourth straight month to its highest level since February of 2022. At the same time, the uncertainty index index also continues to climb. Let's get a read on how business owners feel across the country. Joining us now is Barbara Corcoran, the founder of the Corcoran Group and, of course, executive producer of Shark Tank. Barbara, great having you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to ask you. Thank you very much. I want to ask you about your advice um, to small business owners. They come to you time and again um, for help in growing their businesses, and we're at a time right now where it looks like the economy is growing, but the U.S. consumer is pulling back. What are you telling these business owners? I'm telling them that someone has to get more of a fair share of the market than the next guy, and fear stands in the way. Loneliness stands in the way and it erodes people's confidence. There's always business to be had. Why shouldn't you have it? So I'm getting them to be more aggressive and more confident in reaching out. And of course, Barbara, on Bloomberg, we talk about the Fed all the time. We talk about high interest rates all the time. Uh, Matt has made the point just this morning that even if the Fed cut rates mm. in September, that's going to work with a lag. You're not going to feel that immediately in the economy. What is the on the ground view, the on the ground perspective that you're hearing about how high interest rates are filtering through down to small business owners? Over the last six months, it's been nothing but a series of complaints. I almost put my phone on mute when I get a call <laughs> from someone. But in the last month, I would say once people are past the fear, people are feeling more optimistic. My very tiny entrepreneurs who just started within the last year are feeling more optimistic because they're greatly affected by business loans and they're expecting that rates to come down somewhat. So they're feeling more optimism, I would say, over, overall across the board. When you think across the board as well, and you think about the costs that business owners are still struggling with, it's everything from real estate costs, as you know very, very well, this industry. It's also still wondering about where labor goes from here. What are the biggest challenges you're seeing that they have, and who do you think comes in to fix it? The only one who can fix a business is the entrepreneur themselves. That's why our webinar series sponsored by AT&T Business is so valuable because we give a lot of practical answers and examples and interview a lot of people who are doing it right. Really the only thing that gets in the way of a business moving forward is really thinking that it's a time to be afraid. But what I have learned in business, every time I moved my own business ahead, it was in the worst of times that everybody was a naysayer because when those times hit, everybody's laying low and everybody's afraid to move ahead. And that's when you can actually grab the basis of customers from your main competition if you care to, because there's great opportunity all around that you could take advantage of. Barbara, we talk about interest rates now as if they are uh, sky high and we've never seen anything like this, you know, 7% uh, oh, okay. mortgage rates. You, um, yeah, you know, became famous, uh, made your fortune, started your career in real estate at a time when rates could get much higher. What do you tell people who are worried about, uh, you know, rates at, at, at this level, you know, uh, paralyzing transactions? It's really a waste of time to spend a minute worrying about it. The only thing that counts in growing a business is what can you do about it? And certainly you have no control over the rates. But I do remember when interest rates were 18%, and everybody was afraid of buying except the super rich because they had the capital behind them to go out there and pay all cash for anything they wanted. They took advantage. They got 30% discounts on the market rate of a year before, the price rate of a year before. I tell people that whenever there's a change in the in the making of business and everybody's afraid, just have to look around and see where you could take advantage and where you could go in and scoop something out. At that time when interest rates were 18%, I remember making the actual decision in one day to switch my business halfway out of sales and go into rentals to move with the market. But it's funny how, not even funny, but it's sad how entrepreneurs get stuck with their old reality of what they specialize in and what they're good at. I learned I learned the rental market right away because I had to because there were no sales. Well, to use a personal example, when it comes to real estate, I tried to buy a house, an apartment, uh, and the interest rates were just too high. And my bet there was, OK, I'll just wait a couple of years, sign another multi-year lease, and then hope on the other side uh, that rates will be lower. How much pent-up demand do you think is on the other side of lower mortgage rates from here? tremendous demand because there are so many people thinking exactly as you are and if you would take my advice I would say get out there 
because what you have right now, which you won't have if rates come down another point, they just came down, but you need one more point to bring everybody out into the market. And what's going to happen is you're going to pay more for the house. So what have you really gained by paying the landlord over these years and taking the increases in rent? Not much because prices have gone up, but wait till you see what happens with prices when interest rates come down another percentage point. Well, to that end also, today. right, you know, interest rates go down, prices go up. And at the end of the day, how much, Barbara, do you Always. worry about housing affordability in this country? I worry about it all the time on two fronts. Rents keep going up anywhere in the United States, and that's a real concern because people can't afford the rents based on their income. And I also worry much more so about people getting their piece of the American dream, buying their first house, because the first house market, the starter house market, is the hardest hit where the greatest bidding is going on. I even had, a, I had the daughter of a friend of mine tell me that last week she was competing against her two best friends in the New York market. It's crazy. And she's going to have to invite them for dinner parties after. So <laughs> it's, there's so much competitive bidding, so much going over the price, and so much fear going around because people feel like can't get ahead. No, starter prices are a real problem in America, and they're going up everywhere. Barbara, I want to get back to um, the small businesses you're helping out. You're working with AT&T Business, yes. talking about technology-driven solutions. That immediately makes me think yes. of AI, um, artificial intelligence. And I wonder, you know, given that you've seen the real estate market and business move through the Internet age, what's your take on this new, uh, you know, supposedly revolutionary technology? Well, it's a very good parallel you draw because I remember the days when I went on the internet and I was the first over two years before my competitors went on and what an advantage it was. But I had one magic thing, I wasn't afraid. What's stopping people using AI and with so much chatter is around it, I'm sure you've sensed it, is that people are afraid of it. But it's really like a muscle that you have to use and exercise. And it doesn't even take as much muscle as getting into the internet took, which was rather complicated for a lot of small businesses. All you have to do is schedule 10 minutes a day and just fool around with it. And you start to learn, <clears throat> excuse me, AI and how you can use it in your business. It's the single best thing that has affected small business. And that's why we made it a topic of our third AT&T seminar, because people need to know how they could use a, a, uh, pardon me, A1 to save costs of hiring people that they get for free now by using AI. They used to have to contend with the payroll. Who do I hire? AI does all the grudge work today for every small business. I'm gonna change your attitude to AI. Well, I want to talk about the attitude a little bit more before we let you go, because we're talking about fear among small business owners. There's a lot of ways to get mm -hmm. scared about AI when you think about robots replacing all of our jobs. I mean, how do you get past that fear and actually change the attitude? Well, I have to say people who get past the fear are not the people who are employed. But the people who should have no fear are the people who employ them. Because before you do that next hire that you think you have a need for someone, you try AI. They will answer your needs. So there's really a no fear or shouldn't be fear on the part of the business owner. All right, Barbara, so But enjoyed. don't forget the seminar you could find on 888barbara.com. I have to get that in. Sponsored <laughs> by AT&T Business. I respect it. You got that plug in. Barbara, really enjoyed this conversation. Okay. Hope to have you back soon. That, of Thank course, you. is Barbara Corcoran. Let's get a check on these markets now with Bloomberg's Jess Menton as stocks continue to climb, Jess. They are. So if you look at the S&P 500 up about eight tenths of a percent, not surprisingly being boosted by big tech, especially when you have big components like NVIDIA as well as Apple higher today as well as Alphabet. So moving over though and looking at the VIX actually trading below 20 where it traded most of this year and actually since last of October, obviously before what we saw with the big spike intraday trading last week above 65, but seeing that fear receding ahead of CPI report tomorrow. But if you look over at the two-year yield, trading below 4%, 396 right now. So around the lowest levels of this year. So we know that it's more policy, policy sensitive when it comes to Federal Reserve. But of course, when you look at NYMEX crude oil here, it's actually trading around $78.75 here, actually snapping a five consecutive straight sessions of gains here, down about 1.6% 
on the back of some of these Middle East tensions. But ahead of CPI tomorrow, something I've been keeping a close eye on is looking at hedging against the SPY, so the ETF tracking the S&P 500. Right now, it's costing about two times more than a potential gain in the S&P 500. So actually hovering out its highest level since October. So that shows you people are still putting on a bit of hedges ahead of that report tomorrow. But if you look overall today at some of the bigger gainers, NVIDIA, one of the strong gainers here on the back of, not surprisingly, you had that WSJ report that Huawei is trying to ready some AI chips to compete with that. But nonetheless, you still have that stock higher right now, up almost 5%. You have Starbucks, of course, at right now. It's actually up more than 20% still. So still on pace for its best percentage gain on record. Then, of course, Tesla moving higher to about 3.5% since Elon Musk had that live stream with Donald Trump supporters trying to kind of boost to the different EV cars that he has. And then you can't forget Apple, still a big heavyweight here in the S&P 500, up more than 1%. So big tick leading the way, guys. Jess, thank you so very much for keeping your eye on the market. That is Bloomberg's Jess Menton. And coming up next, we're going to talk about the slowing consumer, what it means for outlet malls. We're going to get insights from Tanger CEO Stephen Yaloff next. Stick with us for that conversation. This is Bloomberg. Making outlet malls cool again. Tanger reporting a solid second quarter as it looks to draw in new shoppers. I'm thrilled to say that joining us now is the CEO, Stephen Yaloff. Great to see you in person. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. So different industries here, but we got Home Depot earnings uh, this right. morning, and you had the CFO talking about this deferral mindset among customers who have the means to spend, but they're sort of uh, holding off here. Are you seeing that deferral mindset among some of your apparel and retail customers? Well. Actually, apparel is doing quite well right now. And right now, we're in the middle of back to school. Back to school starts as early as July 4th, particularly, particularly in our business. And if you take a look, people are starting to go back to school next week. Brutal. So, they're right exactly. <laughs> so there's a lot of activity in our centers. And we're doing a lot on a local basis, trying to get customers in, local customers to come in and shop us. Think about us first. And to your point on the consumer, why wouldn't they think first about the provider, the, uh, the retail provider that gives them uh, their, the brands they're looking for every day at the best possible price. You, and that's what outlet shopping is. You mentioned local customers. When I was a kid, we would always go to the outlet malls when we were traveling, when we were going on vacation right. or coming back. Um, what's the mix in terms of you know, your, your customer base and, and how successful you, have you been getting locals to come in? Sure. Well, the old narrative on outlet was they needed to be 50, 100 miles away from the, their uh, full price or department store business right. because there was wholesale sensitivity. Now we're finding a lot more vertical retailers in the outlet business, using it as a place to clear excess inventory, but also as a place to engage customers. Now a lot of those markets that were 50 miles away, you know, as the you know, the um, as people start to move out of the cities and into the suburbs, those happen to be the a lot of the cities that people are moving into. So. You know, I'm also really curious about your shift away from just outlets to more experiential kind of locations here. How hard is that pivot for you and why is it so important at this time? Well, if you go back four years to COVID, where we lost a lot of retailers to bankruptcy, when those retailers left, we made the decision to start to replace a lot of that square footage with other uses. We found, particularly post-COVID, to get people out of their homes, to get them off the couch, to get them shopping other ways, that we needed to bring them into our centers with better brands, but also better food, uh, better experience, better amenities. And so it's been a big pivot for us from a sort of adding lifestyle components to outlet shopping centers so that we can get that local customer to come in more frequently, stay longer when they're there, and when they stay longer, they ultimately spend more now money. Now, you're doing something pretty challenging here. On one hand, you're diversifying, you're finding new experiences, but it's interesting because you do see, even with a bull market here, re relatively, I know we had a correction, but even with these flying high valuations, you're seeing a ton of bankruptcies out there. In food and retail, just yesterday, a gym that was part owned by Equinox here filed for bankruptcy. How sensitive are you to what's happening out there, frankly? So many companies are feeling so much pressure. Well, at the, at the end of last quarter, there were two retail bankruptcies that affected a lot of folks in the, in the industry. For us, what we've often said, and the narrative has proved true, is that brands, the last stores they're going to close are the ones that are 
cash flowing positively, and the stores are built, and the places where they're doing the most amount of volume. And as it turned out, the two, re, uh, well, it was Express, and Express will come out of it, and uh, Route 21, and they'll come out of it. We, we, we maintain pretty much 90% or, or greater of those portfolios. And some of the stores that closed were stores that had expiring leases that we were going to replace anyway. And I want to talk a little bit more about what you've added to the portfolio recently, executing on six new leases for Sephora, which I have to imagine is pretty big. You think about the following that Sephora has. When you think about adding new brands, new companies to your portfolios, into your outlets, what does that decision tree look like? Well, first of all, we're thinking about the consumer first. What does the consumer want? Because we're all competing to get the consumer off the couch and into our shopping centers. And what's going to do that? You know, apparel has always been a great source of driving the consumer into the retail store because many consumers want to try things on before they buy them. For us, the same thing is true, particularly in experiential retailers like a Sephora that does make up for people, that, that hasn't interacted, that the salesperson plays a huge role in the transaction in those health and beauty stores because you know they're, they're cu the customer's looking for advice. They're looking for, the, for the, um, the folks on the floor to actually give them customer service. Wow, did I say that? Customer service. <laughs> and that really differentiates the in-store experience from, uh, from shopping online or any other uh, way people Well, as someone who gets makeup put on every single day, <laughs> I will attest that it is fun. But looking through uh, your <laughs> earnings call, you said that going into 2025, your strategy here, one of your strategies is to continue to push rent. And I want to know a little bit more about what that means, if you sure. could just explain that a little bit. Well, so if you take a look at the last 10 successive quarters of our business, we've been able to grow our rents. Now, there's two buckets of tenants. You have the, re the ones that are renewing, so that existing tenants that are basically voting to stay in their space as it's built, they're cash flowing positively, and they're going to pay you more rent to stay. Then there's that group of tenants that replace those that are leaving, right? And we call that retenanting. So if you look at the spreads that we reported in the last quarter, we have a blend of retenanting and renewal of about 15% increases in our rents. Closer 10 to 12% on the renewals, but closer to 35 to 40 percent on the retenanting. So for us, it's a great trade for us to, to think about tenants that aren't producing, the stores might be too big, they haven't invested in, in a while, to get them to either downsize or uh, reinvest in their store, and if not, take them out of our shopping centers and replace them with these retailers like a Sephora, like a Victoria's Secret that are coming into our business in a big way, higher sales densities when they trade, and building beautiful stores that draw a customer that comes in shops far more frequently. I wonder about acquiring properties. We talked to Egal Namdar here a lot, who has a lot of mall business, but he's even shifted into office because he finds great discounts. Um, are you acquisitive right now in terms of uh, properties to, to, to build or to take over malls? So fourth quarter of last year, we had built a new center in Nashville, Tennessee. That's been a great success for us. And we bought two centers, one in Huntsville, Alabama, full price uh, shopping center. And then we also bought the existing outlet center in Asheville, um, North Carolina. What we found is acquiring centers is far less expensive than building new shopping centers. But it's also adding to the, to the, um, th the fact that there's not a lot of new product being brought to market. So the less product brought to market creates a little bit more demand. There's a lot of retailers looking for space. And that's part of the reason we've been able to, to push our rents. Stephen, we have to leave it there. That is Stephen Yalov, of okay. course, the CEO of Tanger. So good to see you in person here and hear a little bit more about what's new over at Tanger. Now, coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching this week. That's up next in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get to the trading diary. This is what you need to be watching this week. Of course, we got PPI producer prices out today. Tomorrow, we're going to get the consumer version CPI. That's at 30 a.m. You can check out EcoGo on your terminal to see that. On Thursday, we'll get retail sales data. Shanali's watching that closely. And then speaking of retail on Thursday, we're also going to get earnings from Walmart as well as Deer. I'll be watching the latter closely as 
uh, crop prices have come down. Farmers aren't making enough money to buy new equipment. On Friday, U.S. housing starts are released, and we'll get a look into the residential real estate sector, and then we get University of Michigan consumer sentiment. Uh, they've been good at football lately, and they've always been good at economic data, so we'll look uh, to that. Katie, what are you watching? Well, I'm pretty much watching everything, including uh, CPI tomorrow morning at 8.30, especially because you look at this market reaction to the PPI that we got at 8.30 this morning, a big rally on our hands. The S&P 500 up 1%. Of course, we got better than expected news on PPI, meaning it was softer. Bad news, good news, if you want to phrase it that way. The NASDAQ 100 up 1.6%. Big tech really loving that. The bond market also rallying as well. But uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, I haven't been here for a week. <laughs> While you were gone, the 10-year touched 4%. There we you are go. We're back down to 386. We disinverted for a second, right? We did. That's yeah. what you missed. But when I left Monday of last week, the S&P 500 was down 3% <laughs> on Monday alone. And then since that day, we're up about 3% on the index right now. So it's like nothing changed. We've you made know, all of that back and then some, yeah. What yeah. has roughly wiped out its gains for the month since we started this show is the Russell 2000. Jim Bianco does say it's our fault, but... <laughs> <laughs> but who really knows? That's true. If you look at that, we showed earlier like a, I don't know, a three-month chart of the Russell 2000. We sure did. And you see that it's like a, a, a cliff up and down as if nothing changed, as if it never happened in July, the rotation that we talked about so much every Boy, day. Boy, did we talk about it a lot. <laughs> Coming up tomorrow on Open Interest, the CEO of Shark Ninja Shark joins Ninja. us in the C-suite. We're going to round out the week with the CEOs of Priceline and Evite as well. This is Bloomberg.